peace of Christ be with you today. City Church is a historically rooted and spiritually diverse Christian community. And we're glad that you're with us today. If this is your first time joining us and you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, please feel free to check us out on the web at citychurchftl.com slash welcome. Uh, we're continuing our series called Rooted and this morning we're going to be looking at Romans 12 and what it means to be rooted in hospitality. But before we jump in, hear this call to worship from Psalm 5. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Pray with me. Father, we come to You this morning uh, through the work of Your Son, Jesus, for His life, death, and resurrection. We ask that You'd send Your Spirit among us this morning and draw us into Your presence. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. As we gather together, we have an opportunity to confess together. 
and we're called into confession with these words from Isaiah 43:25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. We'll confess together using the prayer written on the screen, and then I'll give you some time to confess silently. Gracious God, you have given us the law of Moses and the teachings of Jesus to direct us in the way of life. You offer us your Holy Spirit so that we can be born to new life as your children. Yet, O oh God, we confess that the ways of death have a strong attraction and that we often succumb to their lure. Give us the vision and courage to choose and nurture life that we may receive your blessing. Amen. And now, Lord, we ask that you hear us as we confess the way we've sinned against you and against one another. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Our sermon text today is from Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 24. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to the wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, and you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done and still there's more room. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. This is the word of the Lord. In the television show, Undercover Bosses, the premise is that CEOs or other executives from major corporations go undercover within their company to see how things are going at the ground level. Each time I watch one of these episodes, I'm amazed at the transformation, not necessarily of the systems in place, but of the CEOs themselves. When the bosses sit with people, their view of the system changes. There's a narrowing of the distance between the elite and powerful and those in need or even on the margins. What often happens is that the CEOs begin to create space for the flourishing of others. Today, we're talking about the last part of our Rooted series called Rooted in Hospitality. In the next few months, the very place where City Church will call home in partnership with Monarch New American Kitchen and Bar will be a hub of hospitality. Today, we wanna think about 
what hospitality is and how we can best be a people of radical, grace-filled hospitality. Some time ago, I shared a story of Jim Williams, one of the main characters in the book, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Jim was an art dealer and a town socialite who was a big part of the restoration of Savannah, Georgia in the 1950s and 60s. Jim was famous for his annual Christmas party. He had very exclusive guest list. The list was controlled by Williams himself and Williams used this list to his advantage. He was able to control people and have control of the city based on who was invited and who was left off the list. If you do what Jim wants, you get invited. If you don't, you're out. In the Gospels, we see a similar behavior with a group of people called Pharisees. The Pharisees knew God's kingdom was going to be a big party, and they thought they controlled the guest list. They were convinced if they could enact all the Old Testament purity laws and enforce them at every level, then they would earn God's blessing. And if you did what they want, you were in. If you didn't, you were out. It was in the middle of this legalism, as well as the culture, the Greco-Roman patronage culture, that we see Jesus being invited to a dinner party of a well-known connected man. Luke 14, verses 7 through 11 says, Now he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't sit in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. And then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, Jesus is actually talking about something that was commonplace. The patronage system went like this. In every community, there were certain prominent wealthy individuals, and if you wanted to improve your station in life to move up at all, you had to make one of those people your patron. If that person was your patron, that person gave you loans, gave you gifts, opened doors for you, you were a part of their network. Well, this was the context of this dinner that Jesus was attending. This was a high-powered network event people trying to meet each other, and you're either trying to sustain or advance your place in the network. So the host was, of course, the seat of honor. And then depending on how well you knew the host or how important you were in that person's life, you would either sit closer or farther away. So when you showed up, you had to choose a seat. It was just protocol at the time, and there's a lot of savviness in which seat you chose because it's hard to guess where you should sit. You never knew who else was coming to dinner. And so Jesus says, you know the rule. The rule is always you sit further away so the host can say, hey, what are you doing down there? Come on up. That encourages you because publicly you've been affirmed. The problem is if you guess wrong and take too high a seat and then somebody else comes in and you get asked, hey, I'm gonna need you to move down a seat. So Jesus is actually using a cultural idea to basically illustrate this profound principle. In verse 11, he says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus is using a cultural moment to illustrate a truth that actually runs all the way through the Bible. But then Jesus flips this whole thing around by what he says next to the host of the party. In verses 12 through 14, he says, When you give a dinner or a banquet... Do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. It was in this moment that Jesus gave a new definition to hospitality. See, in this culture, and even in our own, hospitality is often shown to someone who's deemed deserving or one who can reciprocate. But the table fellowship of Jesus with its ethic of grace instead of you do something for me, I do something for you, was creating this new countercultural movement. See, throughout the book of Luke, Jesus is either on his way to a meal, at a meal, or leaving a meal. 
Multiple times you see Jesus giving and receiving hospitality from the wrong kinds of people. And shockingly, Jesus, in the middle of a crowd of all the right people, turns to this very important host and drops a rebuke on him as he tells him what the system of grace is like. At first glance, Jesus looks like he's actually saying to not ever invite your family or your friends to dinner. But that's not what he's saying. This was a Semitic, idiomatic expression. What he's saying is what you should prefer is to bring people into your home, not because they can pay you back or even add value to your life, but as an expression of love because of grace that we have received from God. He's calling them and us to gospel hospitality. In Romans 12, 13, it says for Christians to practice hospitality. Rosaria Butterfield frames hospitality this way. Radically ordinary gospel hospitality is bringing people into your home in a way that makes strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family. Think about how Butterfield uses the word home and think about what home means to you. It's a place where you live. It's a space that you occupy where you're rejuvenated. Whereas out there, you're drained. Home is a place where you can just be yourself because Maybe out there you have to be on for others. Home can also be a space that you unwind or refresh. And it doesn't even have to be your literal home. Uh, It might be somewhere you feel at home, maybe a restaurant or a bar or a coffee shop. It might be the beach, whatever gives you a sense of home. So the first part of showing hospitality is inviting people into whatever space that refreshes you so that they can experience the same refreshing. Most often, it's a space that includes food and drink. Hospitality is welcoming someone into the experience of sharing something, even something simple, together. It might be a meal, it might be a drink, it might be a dessert, but it often involves a table. Table fellowship was one of the primary ways that we saw Jesus show hospitality in the book of Luke. Even in someone else's home. He was welcoming people, entering their lives, and inviting them into his through the sharing of food. So as we look at this idiomatic way that Jesus frames verses 12 through 14, who do we actually invite to the table? Well, the word hospitality literally means love of stranger. Strangers are people who are different. They're not like you. They're not just your kind of person. They might be a different race or have a different socioeconomic status or just be different in some way. Now, when the Bible says to Christians, you must practice hospitality and practice hospitality to strangers, what kind of strangers are we talking about? Well, I'm going to talk about three kinds, three kinds in the Bible that Christians should be looking out for. The first is this. We, We talk at City Church often about how City Church is a spiritually diverse Christian community. And what we mean by that is that Our belief is firmly a historic Christian faith, but we have people here who are a part of a spectrum of belief. We have doubters and skeptics to people who are faithful and committed. So we practice hospitality with the people in the church who may not agree with us or or who may not believe the same things we do. And this is one group of strangers. Another group is our literal neighbors. We make space for people who retreat to homes in proximity to ours. It's actually the easiest because these are the people who we'll see on a regular basis. We can actually welcome them into our lives and we can care for what's happening in theirs. But actually the literal point of Jesus in verse 12 through 14 is that hospitality is shown to those people who have real needs and who often can't repay you. John Newton was a slave trader who, after he became a Christian, he helped abolish the slave trade in England and wrote hymns like Amazing Grace. Newton looked at this passage in Luke 14, and he knew it was an idiomatic expression, but he says, I don't think it's unlawful to entertain our friends, but if these words do not teach us that in some respects our duty is to give preference to the poor, I'm at a loss to understand them. What Newton is saying is, If you don't realize how instinctive it is to invite people that you want to know, that in some ways are fulfilling to you, and Jesus says, don't just do that. Welcome those who are hurting, those who have needs, those who are poor, those without status. 
When you show love to the stranger by welcoming them into your home or place of rest and refreshment, you'll be surprised at how many that God will turn into family and even allow you to share in the joys of the gospel with one another. Tim Chester says this, it's common to hear that we need to reach the cultural elite and the opinion formers if we want to transform the culture. But the danger is that if we adapt to reach the rich and powerful on their terms, then nothing changes. In Luke's gospel, the alternative strategy for reaching people is to point to the table fellowship of Jesus and embodying the table fellowship of Jesus. This isn't about power or influence. It's about an alternative city within a city. It's a community that is based on grace and where each person is amazed and then extends that amazing grace to one another. It's a community that outside of the gospel would never work because we don't have that much in common. So after Jesus brings up this alternative system of hospitality, the conversation turns to the kingdom of God and Jesus describes the ultimate feast in Luke 14, 15 through 24. See, this is a picture of God's great banquet. This is the party of all parties. The feast of the kingdom of God is the ultimate feast at the end of time. When God renews the world, death and suffering goes away, and God spreads the table and invites us to the feast. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about home, uh, what it takes for something to be truly called home. See, Jesus is giving us a picture of a table, but this is bigger. It's a table in our true home. See, Home is not just a place where you rest and recharge, but the true idea of home is a place where your hurts are healed, where all of your deepest appetites are fulfilled. Home is a place of beauty and warmth and consolation. There is no home on earth that can truly fulfill it. Even if you had a dream home, it doesn't actually fulfill it. Even if you go back to the place where you remember, the certain place where you considered your true home, but you never really can go back. Why? Because all of those longings are longings ultimately for God's true home, where ultimate hospitality is shown. This is what you're looking for. No matter who you are, this is the table. This is the party. This is the home that you've been looking for. It's the table of God. So how do you get it? Well, Jesus says in Matthew 5 that you have to be poor in spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, you can't be middle class in spirit. Middle class in spirit says, well, look, I, I'm not, I know I'm not perfect, I'm not, but I'm not terrible. I'm not a bad person. It's not like I don't deserve anything. I deserve some things, but I just need a little help. But poor in spirit says, I've done bad things, and I've done good things, and even my good things were often with bad motives. Even my good things were trying to control people or make me feel better about myself, trying to prove myself, trying to get control of God so that he has to do things for me. I need God to be merciful to me. This is based on grace. See, Jesus didn't come for people who have it all together. He came for people who don't have it all together. And the only way that we can be rescued is to admit that, to come to grips with that. Robert Karras says this, in Luke's gospel, Jesus got himself killed because of the way he ate. When Jesus eats with Levi, the message is clear. Jesus has come for losers, people on the margins, people who have made a mess of their lives, people who are ordinary. Jesus has come for you. The only people who are left out are the self-important. Jesus' table is a table of grace in our true home. Every time we gather with people in our home, in our space to show hospitality, we're welcoming people to sense what God's home is like. So let us, as God's people, be rooted in hospitality, welcoming people into our homes and spaces, sharing food and drink and grace so that strangers become neighbors and neighbors become family. Let's pray. God, thank you that by your grace, you welcome us into your true home. May we give an expression of that as we welcome those into our homes and spaces, as we share the table, food and drink, all for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 
Now that we have heard this good news of the gospel, let's affirm our faith together. Let us affirm our faith together with these words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this online Worship at Home resource. If you want to know more about City Church or to communicate with us in any way, you can go to our website at citychurchftl.com. I do want to let you know that our live in-person services are now being held at the Island City Park Preserve in Wilton Manors, Florida. They are going to be at 1030 a.m. And uh, if you want to know more about where to go and how to get there, you can find that on the website as well. Also, today is our Church Commitment Sunday as we conclude our Rooted series. As we look to be rooted in this community in this next season, uh, you can join with us in giving to the mission and vision of City Church. You can go online at citychurchroots.com to find out more information about this campaign and how you can be a part of it. And so as we leave today, let me send you out with this blessing from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.